Hello and good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, an introduction to the F1 student visa and STEM OPT. We have a great presentation ahead of us this afternoon, uh, but before we get there, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone in attendance will receive a link to download the recording after today's live session. You will also receive a link to download the accompanying slide deck, as well as the SHRM and HRCI continuing education credits. All of these materials will arrive in your email inboxes tomorrow afternoon, so please keep an eye out for that message from us. And if for whatever reason you don't receive it, just please let us know and we'll be sure to send it your way. Uh, also, uh, I realized, uh, we realized that the F1 has been in the news lately, so we're anticipating uh, quite a few questions. Uh, if you do have a question, you can type it in using the GoToWebinar question box that you should see on your screen. Uh, so please type that question in and we'll try to get to it either during or at the very end during our dedicated Q&A se uh, section of today's presentation. However, I just want to uh, remind everyone that we can only answer uh, general questions about the F1 and STEM OPT today. Uh, we cannot answer any specific questions or very case specific questions over the broadcast. Uh, so in those instances, please consult with your immigration attorney or your Envoy and Global Immigration Associates team for further information. And my final housekeeping note, um, please excuse any audio or video interruptions that may occur today. Uh, we all have, uh, you know, internet connections that may go in and out. Uh, we're not anticipating anything. Um, again, we are not anticipating anything happening, but uh, you know, given how we are all remote, some things uh, just want to make everyone aware of that. If you're experiencing audio trouble, I uh, recommend maybe signing out really quickly and then signing back on. Hopefully that'll clear up the issue. All right, so moving along, I want to talk a little bit about Envoy Global. For nearly 20 years, Envoy has been on a mission to fix the inefficient, frustrating, and confusing immigration process. Envoy combines a top-ranked legal team with innovative technology to deliver the only platform that makes it seamless for companies to hire, mobilize, and manage a global workforce. Envoy secures work authorization in over 100 countries, has grown 37% year-over-year, and works with over 1,000 customers. We are particularly proud of our NPS score, which is a testament to the employee experience that we provide. And joining us this afternoon is Jordan Mendez, a senior associate at Global Immigration Associates. Jordan's practice focuses on non-immigrant visa categories, including the E2, E3, H1B, L1, O, and TN visas. Jordan also has extensive experience with immigrant processing, including PERM, EB1, EB2, and EB3 immigrant petitions. And Jordan works with several clients in many industries, including technology, healthcare, hospitality, and educational services. Jordan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Eric. Great. So, Jordan, uh, we have one, I have one more uh, quick little disclaimer, legal disclaimer slide that I want to leave up for our attendees for a couple of seconds. And so with that, uh, we're going to jump right away into our first section regarding some recent news on the F1 student visa, uh, non-immigrant students taking online classes. So Jordan, um, on July 14th, the administration rescinded its proposed rules that would have barred international students from studying in the United States if, the un if their university had moved to a full course load online. So Jordan, uh, let's kind of, you know, take a step back, go back in time a little bit. Can you talk about what were these proposed rules and what did they entail? Sure. So thanks again for the introduction and it's nice to talk to everyone today. Um, I wanted to start off by just addressing what the status quo was pre-COVID. So Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, the agency charged with overseeing F1 student compliance, enforced specific rules pertaining to online classes. 
And again, this is during normal times, pre-pandemic. So at that time, the regulation, well, the regulation states that no more than the equivalent of one class or three credits per semester can be counted toward the full course of study requirement if the class is taken online or through distance education and does not require the student's physical attendance for class. So this really limited the online class option for F1 students. And once universities started modifying their their class schedule due to COVID, ICE released a, a memo changing that policy in the middle of March. And they allowed for more flexibility because they were seeing universities shut down and switch to online classes, they allowed for some exemptions to those standard rules. So those exemptions included if a school had completely closed and was not even offering online classes or any other alternate learning procedures, then the students would remain in valid F1 status. And that's as long as the students intended to resume their course of study when classes resumed. In situations where a school had temporarily stopped in-person classes, but had implemented online or other alternate learning procedures, then the non-immigrant student would also remain in F1, valid F1 status as long as they were participating in these online courses or these other alternate learning opportunities outlined by the school. I did clarify at that time that the temporary provisions would only be in effect for the duration of COVID. On July 6th, I announced a modification to those exemptions. And this was really unexpected, caught a lot of universities and foreign nationals off guard. It basically rescinded that those exemptions outlined in the middle of March and um, required the following. So for those universities that were only allowing online classes, then I said that students attending schools operating entirely online may not take a full online course load and remain in the U.S., essentially meaning that students living in the U.S. would need to leave and students who are planning to come to the U.S. to study at a university with only online courses would no longer be able to. I also outlined for those schools that had or we're planning to in the fall adopt a hybrid model, which is a mixture of online classes and in-person classes. In that case, F1 students would be allowed to take more than one class or three credit hours online, but there were extra steps involved in order for them to remain in invalid status. Those extra steps included the school having to make attestations to ICE that the program is not entirely online, the student is not taking an entirely online course load for the fall 2020 semester, and that the student is taking the minimum number of online classes required to make normal progress in their degree program. Hmm. I see. So Jordan, uh, why, uh, why did the administration rescind the proposed exemption or the proposed rule? Yeah, so everything I just outlined has since been rescinded. Um, well, not everything, but the most recent July 6th um, modification to those exemptions. And that's because the Trump administration received a lot of backlash on this and really quickly. Harvard and MIT filed a lawsuit that was followed by California public colleges and a coalition of 17 different states. The universities accused the administration of committing several violations of a federal law known as the Administrative Procedure Act. And that law concerns how certain decision-making decision power resides with federal agencies. So here, the universities that argued that ICE's new policy was not legally justified it was arbitrary and capricious and thus un illegal under the act. As a result, on July, on July 14th, the Trump administration rescinded that July 6th policy that was walking back the modifications allowed for online classes. 
Okay. And so, uh, Jordan, where does that leave us now? So now we're back to that original set of exceptions that ICE made back in March. If the university is only allowing or only offering online classes, then students in F1 status will remain in ballot status taking those online classes and can remain in the U.S. In a situation if the university, let's say, opens up in the fall but then has to close down again because of the pandemic, the F1 student will remain in ballot status as long as they resume their course of study when the school opens back up. Gotcha. Um, great. So Jordan, thank you so much for providing uh, an update on this on, on the recent news. Uh, and that's going to lead us into our next section where we're now going to move into a more in-depth look, look at the F1 visa. Uh, so Jordan, what is the F1 visa? So the F1 is a visa that is for students who are pursuing a full course of academic or professional study and the program must ultimately result in a diploma, degree, or certificate. Gotcha. And so what are some requirements of the F1? Yeah, so some additional criteria must be met for a student to qualify for this type of visa. And as you see outlined here, um, the school must be approved by the Student and Exchange Visitors Program which is the Department of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The F1 student must also be proficient in English or at least be enrolled in courses leading to English proficiency. Mm -hmm. The student must have sufficient funds available for self-support during the entire proposed course of study. And the student must also maintain a residence abroad for which they have no intention of giving up. I see, I see, okay. Um, and so, Jordan, a common question um, that we see on prior presentations that we did on F1 and over the course of the year um, is if someone can work on the F1 visa. So I'm curious, what can you tell us about working on uh, an F1 visa? So there's various types of work opportunities that may be permissible under the F1 student visa. We're just going to discuss a few today. These are types of employment authorization that we most commonly see students holding um, when working with our clients. So the first one is called CPT, and that is that stands for Curricular Practical Training. That is work authorization granted to a student while they're still enrolled and actively taking classes at the university. To obtain CPT, a person in charge of the foreign national students at the university, they're called the DSO, Designated School Official. I'll be using that term throughout the presentation. They must authorize the CPT on the student's form I-20. This is a immigration form where um, that outlines the student's authorization to work and, um, and specifics as to their F1 student status. The requirements for to obtain CPT is that the employment must be integral to the student's program of study and it requires a signed cooperative agreement or letter from the employer. It does not require um, an actual employment authorization document, so it doesn't require the filing of that I-765 form. Um, we just need to see authorization on that I-20 form. It can be full-time or part-time um, with a, a few caveats. So we may see sometimes that the, the CPT is granted for just a summer internship, for example. And other times we'll see CPT can be granted for a full 12 months. And the detriment or the downside of that is that if a foreign national is working for 12 months in CPT, they're not eligible for that post-completion OPT. Um, that, that's the next category of employment authorization that we'll discuss. And that applies if they're working in CPT full-time for a year, they're not eligible for that OPT. But if they're working in part-time CPT, that would not prevent them from being able to obtain the, the OPT. And so we see that men, that you may have employees working for you under CPT before they graduate, 
And you also may have employees who are not locked into H-1B cap. They don't have any other options for work, work authorization. So they may re-enroll in school in order to obtain CPT. Um, while this is allowed, we do see scrutiny from USCIS when the foreign national is applying for H-1B again. The next category that we're going to discuss is the post-completion OPT, the op optional practical training. And this grants F1 students one year of employment authorization after they finish their program of study and after they graduate. It must be full time. And again, we see that it must relate to the student's course of study. For example, if a student obtains a degree in computer science, the F1 student needs to be working in a job that requires those um, skills that he obtained, he or she obtained during the computer science degree, so IT-related job duties. Again, it requires authorization from that DSO, the designated school official, on the I-20 form. And here, unlike the CPT, they must submit the I-765, which is the form asking for an employment authorization document, an EAD. And the student can't start working for the employer until they actually have that EAD in hand. Um, so there's something that at least I have seen with my clients that's come up um, more frequently now due to the current state of the economy is unemployment. And so there are rules that say that a student can only be unemployed on post-completion OPT for 90 days total. And there are some reporting requirements as far as updates to employment um, that are required with post-completion OPT, but those primarily fall on the student employee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so Jordan, uh, one of the uh, you talked about is uh, STEM OPT. I'm curious to hear more about STEM OPT and kind of the, the basics of STEM OPT. Yeah, so this is the third employment authorization category that we're going to discuss. And this is, um, this is an option for those F1 students who receive their bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics from an accredited student and exchange visitor program certified school. In that case, students can apply for a two-year extension to further extend their employment authorization after their post-completion OBT and continue to work. ICE has a published list of eligible degree programs to be able to determine which degree fields qualify for the STEM extension. Mm. Okay. And moving on to the next slide, what are some of the benefits of STEM OPT? Yeah, so this is an opportunity for employers to continue to employ those F1 students who they had working for them in OPT status or hire those um, who have obtained that STEM EAD and who they eventually hope to employ, continue to employ in H-1B status. It also creates opportunities for training in STEM fields where, where it's needed and allows for that cultural diversity and exchange between employers and their employees. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, great, so Jordan, thank you for kind of, for going into uh, explaining this particular section and you know, working on an F-1 visa. Uh, that's gonna lead us into our next section of uh, rules for employers. And so Jordan, for this section, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Uh, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Okay, great, thanks, Eric. Um, so there are, it is more burdensome. The STEM OPT EAD does have more requirements on the employer than just the, um, the OPT. So STEM OPT employers must have an FEIN and be enrolled in an E-Verify program at the STEM OPT worksite. The as I mentioned earlier, the employment opportunity must be directly related to the student's qualifying degree. And we must receive authorization from the school's DSO in the I-20 form. 
the student has to file that I-765 form to obtain employment authorization in that EAD card. But unlike post-completion OPT, the employee does not have to actually wait to have that card in hand to begin work. So they can continue to work if they've timely filed their extension, their STEM EAD extension, meaning that they've filed their STEM EAD extension prior to the OPT expiration date. Even if they don't have that EAD in hand, they can continue to work while that is pending with USCIS for 180 days after the expiration of the OPT EAD. Eric, you can move to the next slide, please. So the um, ICE Immigration and Customs Enforcement also requires that Form I-983 be filled out, and this is a training plan when the student is applying for the STEM EAD. So there are sections on this training plan for both the employer and the employee. And the government, the purpose of this is that the government wants to make sure this truly is a training program for the employee to enhance their learning from their academic program, apply the theoretical knowledge that they obtain from their coursework, and be able to obtain that practical knowledge at the work site. And so the way that they ensure that this is being done is by um, having the employer and employee fill out this training plan, the I-983. Here you outline the, the job duties and it also requires some compensation information. There's no minimum um, salary or prevailing wage like there is in the H-1B context, but it must the salary must be in line with what similarly situated U.S. employees are being paid. Eric, you can move on. The training plan requires the F1 employee and the employer to outline the student's role with the employer, lay out specific goals and objectives the student will set out to achieve during their time with the employer, and explain how the employer will provide oversight and supervision to the employee. At the one year mark after the um, STEM EAD has been obtained, the employer must perform an evaluation of the student's work. And then again, at the final, at the end of the program, they must do an evaluation again. And here is an opportunity for the employer to provide feedback on successful projects, um, offer overall contributions in areas for skill and comp competency development. Uh, an F1 student can't work for multiple employers while on the STEM OPT EAD, but they can change employers if needed at some point during that STEM um, OPT period. Eric, you can move to the next slide. So there's some additional attestations that the um, employer would be signing off on when signing that I-983 training plan. One of those being that the employer will not replace a U.S. worker with the STEM F-1 employee. They would also be ensuring that the F-1 holder's compensation and other working conditions are commensurate with those of similarly situated U.S. employees, and also agreeing to undergoing compliance inspections conducted by ICE. Um, labor for higher arrangements and volunteer employment do not qualify under STEM OPT. Eric, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so there are some additional reporting requirements under the STEM EAD that the employer is responsible for. Any material changes to the I-983 training plan, and they must also ensure that the F-1 foreign um, national holds at least 20, works at least 20 hours per week to continue to qualify. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Jordan, for going over some of these very important rules for employers. 
Um, I'm actually going to take a, a brief pause right here. Um, we're getting a couple questions on the slides and the recording. Uh, so I just want to um, remind our attendees that the PowerPoint slides will be made available to download and you will also receive a recording of the presentation tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so Jordan, as we move on to the next section, there are some important requirements that need to be navigated. So curious if you can walk our attendees through this next section. Sure. So I, as I mentioned, there are additional reporting requirements for the employer. And to provide a few examples of those material changes that would warrant um, having to report that to the DSO, the designated school official at the F1 student school. This would include any changes of the employer identification number resulting from a corporate restructuring. Um, it would also include a reduction in student compensation that is not tied to reduction in hours worked. Any significant decrease in hours of week per week in, in hours per week that a student works and also changes to the employer's commitments or students learning objective objectives as documented on that form i 983 mm -hmm. and uh so jordan as we want to move on to this next slide um we are getting a couple of questions on F1 layoffs. So I think this would be a good time to bring up uh, this particular question. Uh, and the question is, can you talk a little bit more about what would happen in the case of a layoff for an F1 employee? Sure. Um, so the with the loss of an employment, an employer and the student must notify the DSO within five days of when mm -hmm. the student's employment is terminated. Um, if it is, in fact, you know, if the student is laid off and in the period of employment terminated before that EAD expires. Um, the max unemployment to maintain valid F1 status is 150 days, and this would include any of those days that were accrued while the student was on their OPT, their post-completion okay. OPT. Um, if the student, let's say the student has had any unemployment days um, and their EAD is about to expire um, and their employment comes to an end, then they would have a 60 day grace period. And that grace okay. period will allow for them to um, look for an opportunity to potentially stay in the US by changing status to another um, visa category or um, make plans to leave the U.S. as well if they cannot if they cannot change status. Gotcha. Great. Uh, thank you for answering that question. And another question that came in. Um, it sounds like a lot of work to obtain uh, CPT, OPT, and STEM EAD falls on the students' coordination directly with the school. Uh, so this individual is curious on the services that uh, GIA um, and Envoy provide to help with an F1 student's employment. Yeah, so that's great. Um, we would not really be involved in an employee's effort to obtain CPT or OPT authorization. You know, of course, we would be available for the employer for any questions they may have or any guidance to provide any guidance that may come up in situations such as layoffs or just you know what we discussed in the beginning of the presentation with um, policy changes we can definitely be a resource for that and then other questions we may have to direct um, the employee specifically to the dso because they really are the ones who are ultimately signing off on that i-20 and employment authorization for the stem ead um, we can play a bigger role there. We can help by filing the I-765, the Employment Authorization Document Extension. Um, we can also help with drafting the STEM training plans. Um, we encourage employers to work with their attorneys to notify them of any employees that they have in, in F1 status 
as early on as possible if they do plan to continue to employ them past their their F1 um, expiration date, so after their EAD expires. And the reason why we'll want to know this is because we would want to consider and, and evaluate whether we should enter that foreign national into the H-1B cap lottery. And the cap lottery for H-1B happens um, in, on April 1st of each year. And this is an opportunity for employers to submit an application for the H-1B visa in the lottery. If all goes well, their application is selected and the petition is ultimately approved, then this would allow the employees to con this would grant additional work authorization in H-1B status. So it would allow for the employer to continue to employ that student past that STEM OPT expiration. Great, thank you for answering that question. Uh, another question that's come up from a couple of attendees, um, how can I best set up my company for success to continue to employ an F1 student after their STEM EAD expires and increase the chances for the student to obtain an H-1B visa? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, again, I would say you know, entering the F1 student into the lottery as early on as possible is a great way to increase the likelihood that they're ultimately successful. Um, this can be as early as when the student is on post-completion OPT or even before. So the goal, again, is to allow for as many shots at the lottery as possible while that student is maintaining work authorization and continuing to be employed with the company so that we can avoid a gap in work authorization. If they're eligible for a STEM OPT, obviously this increases the likelihood of being selected as well because it gives them more time on valid work authorization and therefore additional chances at the lottery. So for example, if we have a foreign national who graduated in May with a master's in the STEM field, and then let's say company ABC hires them, the foreign national currently working, and the foreign national is currently working on their post-completion OPT um, EAD, which is valid for a year. So we can enter this F1 foreign national into the H1B cap lottery next April, and then if they're not selected, he, he or she would simply extend his his work authorization for another two years by means of the STEM OPT EAD and be able to continue to work for the company. Um, we can then try again in the next year's lottery and if necessary, again, in that next year's lottery. If the foreign national has a master's degree, this increases their likelihood of being selected in the lottery as well because those with a U.S. master's degree are um, run through the master's degree lottery and then if not selected they're run through another lottery that's for those with bachelor's degree so they essentially get two shots within the same lottery. Mm, I see. Great thank you Jordan so much for answering uh, those couple of questions in this section. Um, I'm taking a look at also some questions that are going to lead perfectly into our next uh, section in this presentation, and that is uh, STEM, OPT, and CAP gap. So, Jordan, just curious, uh, what is this? Uh, what is STEM, OPT, and CAP gap? Yeah. So, if let's say an um, if an F1 student H1B was selected and approved in the, was selected in the lottery and was approved then the earliest work authorization in H-1B status would be on October 1st of the year that that application is filed. So those H-1B um, applicants who were selected and approved in this year's lottery would not be able to change status to H-1B until October 1st. So that leaves the question of what happens if a foreign national student's EAD expires between 4-1, April 1st, when the CAP um, lottery occurs, and that October 1st date when they would change status to H-1B. And 
this is where the government has created what's called cap gap and it's a, a legal extension of work authorization from the end of their EAD expiration from the date their EAD expires until 10 1. It prevents a gap in work authorization for those who will ultimately be changing to H1B status, um, but their EAD is not valid until 10 1. If a petition is ultimately denied, then they would not be able to take advantage of that cap gap. So they would lose work authorization and have to, if they can't change to another status, they would need to make plans to leave the U.S. So students who are, um, again, this is, I kind of already went over this, but if you're eligible for STEM OPC ex extension, um, we do encourage students to apply for this even if their H-1B cap petition is selected because in case that it's not ultimately approved, they have backup work authorization to fall back on. So we do get that question a lot, you know, if a foreign national's EAD is expiring in, um, their OPT EAD is expiring, let's say in, in August, but they're eligible for a STEM EAD extension and their H-1B is still pending, their H-1B cap petition is still pending, I would encourage them to go ahead and apply for that EAD extension because if anything were to ultimately happen with their H-1B, they can continue to work in that STEM EAD. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan, for explaining that. And uh, that's going to wrap up the main presentation and bring us to our audience Q&A. We have um, about five minutes or so. Uh, so at this point, um, I uh, just want to, again, um, if you have a question for Jordan, uh, please type it in and we will try to answer it. Uh, again, please keep in mind that we can only answer uh, general questions. We cannot really get into anything case specific or company specific over this live broadcast. In those instances, please consult with your immigration attorney or please reach out to your Envoy and Global Immigration Associates team for more information. Um, so, do, 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 uh, please excuse any awkward uh, silences here. Jordan and I need to um, communicate to ensure that the questions that we may select are appropriate to answer over the air. Um, so, Jordan, I'm send, sending you a couple. Let me know your thoughts on that, on those. Um, yeah, sure. So this first one, Eric, does working full-time on CPT for a summer have an impact on OPT? And no, as long as they're not working full-time for one year, they should still be eligible for that post-completion OPT after they finish their program of study. Great. Thank you. Um... Um, so this next question is, how has working from home impacted STEM OPT students? And I think that the main impact is on the training plan, right? Because employers may have outlined in their training plan weekly in-person meetings with supervisor to discuss you know, what happened that week and next week's goals, for example. So training plans may need to be modified to say that you're gonna have virtual meetings, Zoom meetings. I would recommend um, video as much as possible. Um, training opportunities that were normally in person may be more on, um, on online and through Zoom. So the, the STEM EAD requirement to offer supervision and training is still in place, just the way that that is accomplished may look different now. Um, um, okay. Yeah, Jen, so I'll set you a couple of questions and uh, if, those, if they're okay, please feel free to address. If not, just uh, move on to the next one. 
Sure. Um, thoughts on pending USCIS furlough? Yeah, I mean, that will definitely impact the adjudication timelines. And it's yet to be seen. I mean, it's right around the corner, supposedly, but there is a possibility that it won't happen. We'll have to wait and see. Um, we do expect processing times to increase significantly. We already have seen that the pr printing of EAD cards has taken a lot longer. Um, receipt notices and approval notices have been extremely delayed as well. So if there are mass furloughs within USCIS, I expect that only to get worse and um, you know impact um, other, just have delays with, with extension, petitions, amendments, et cetera, for other visa categories. Um, best place to check online for these rules and regulations involving STEM OPT? That's a great question. Um, there is a resource called Study in the States. If you just Google that, um, that is a website. Um, just making sure it comes up the first. Yeah, studyinthestates.dhs.gov. This is a um, ICE website that offers recent updates, and you can subscribe to their blog. Um, they have the compliance, they have outlined compliance for students, compliance for schools, and have other tools there to help out as well. So that's the best place to go to. Um, also, uh, the students always, sorry. Oh, I was just like, uh, can, can you quickly repeat the name of that website? Yes, it's studyinthestates.dhs.gov. And I was going to say that um, students always also have as a resource their DSO, that designated school official at their school. They are in charge of, you know, navigating these programs and helping the students um, get that I-20 authorization for work and and helping maintain compliance. So they are a great resource as well. Great, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, I think we're going to wrap things up there, uh, Jordan. There are just there are a lot of questions and to the attendees that are asking these questions. These are very great questions, but again, unfortunately, we really cannot answer these live over the air. Uh, so again, please reach out to your immigration attorney or your envoy and Global Immigration Associates team for further information. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, again, as a final reminder. The recording and the slide deck will be sent out tomorrow afternoon, as well as the SHRM and HRCI continuing education credits. So thank you for joining us, Jordan. Thank you so much for this great presentation and uh, going in depth about the F1. And uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.